Uh, I'm Paul Bloom. I'm a professor of psychology and cognitive science at Yale University, and this is the Mind Report. And I am delighted to be talking to John Ronson, and I'll let John introduce himself. Hi, I'm, I'm John Ronson. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a writer and a journalist. Not that those two things are different. <laughs> you're, you're, okay, I'm going to have to help you out here. You're the author of, a, of, of many best-selling books like uh, Them, The Men Who Stare at Goats, the, uh, the Psychopath Test, which most of what we'll be doing is we'll be talking about it today, mm -hmm. and most recently a collection of your articles, Lost at Sea, and you've done much journalism and radio and movies and so on. Um, mostly I want to talk to you about something which I'm interested in and connects to my work and the work of some of my colleagues, which is empathy and psychopathy and a bit of clinical diagnosis and so on. But I'll begin with a gossipy question. Um, in The Men Who Stare at Goats, you're played by Ewan McGregor. He doesn't have your name, but he's your, he's your character. Was that really cool when you heard that was going to happen? Uh, okay, well, I mean, my honest answer was I was, I was, I was surprised that somebody so kind of... Um, Handsome. Yeah, leading man actually yeah. had been chosen. In, in, a, in a new film, there's a new film in production right now, which I co-wrote the screenplay of, and it's based on one of my stories uh, called Frank, and, in, and it's got Michael Fassbender in it and, and Maggie Chippenhall. But in this film, the, the, the kind of me character is, is um, being played by um, a young Irish actor called Donald Gleeson, who's very, you know, geeky and socially awkward and uncomfortable in his own skin. And, and I feel very comfortable being played by somebody like that. And, and uh, in fact, he even looks, I don't know if fact, he's about two foot taller than me, he actually looks like I looked when I was his age. So, so that feels kind of more appropriate. I was, I was, I was, I suppose I was a little bit concerned with, with, uh, the many set goats that part of the, the, the kind of joke of the movie is that somebody, you know, as kind of, um, never she is me, yeah. you know, people as, as kind of awesome as, you know, um, psychic soldiers. Uh, and I, and I worried slightly that you and McGregor wouldn't be visually differentiatable enough yeah. from, from George Clooney. Um, however, I think he was very good at kind of reducing himself. Um, you know, sort of hunching himself up a little bit. Uh, and as a result, I think he did, it, he did a good job. But it was certainly a counterintuitive um, suggestion, uh, casting, but, but not in the new movie. In the new movie, Frank, I think Donald Gleeson is just, he's just as, you know, awkward as I am and will fit into a kind of meet-up role, like a hand in glove. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. It's a refreshingly humble answer. And you, actually, your first book, uh, not, well, the book, your book, Them, Mm. I had read somewhere that that's also been going to be into a movie. Well, I don't know if this ever going to happen. It was it, it was up an option or something. Yeah, well, it was actually purchased in the end because the option ran out, so they did have to buy it. Uh, it was optioned by um, Universal, and Mike White wrote a screenplay who wrote uh, School of Rock and oh, yeah. a great Jennifer Aniston movie called The Good Girl. Uh, he wrote, and I was over the moon. And Edgar Wright. Um, said he was going to direct it, and then instead of directing it, Edgar directed uh, Scott Pilgrim. And as the years went on, then it sort of just sort of you know just wilted on the vine. Now I see it as like one of those Austrian kidnapped Austrian girls <laughs> uh, stuck in a basement somewhere, like unable to see the light light of day. <laughs> quite quite a tasteful analogy, <laughs> wasn't it? But it's. Um, so, you know, Stanley Kubrick's lawyer, I made a documentary a few years ago about Stanley Kubrick, and his lawyer said to me, he said, oh, it's kind of grizzled old Jewish guy in North London, and he said to me, John, what have you got to remember about films? They never get made. And I was sort of waiting, and that was it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so the fact that two of my stories have now been made into films, Many State Goats and, and Frank, which is coming up, is a miracle. So it's not so much surprising that then didn't get made. It's surprising that the others okay. did because it's just so hard. To, it's just so hard to get movies made. It's just so hard. Well, it, it may be a miracle. It's well, it's well deserved. You're a gorgeous writer, and the stories you tell are amazing. Actually, I'm just going to jump in with the Nebuchadnezzar thing. So, mm -hmm. one of the things that's interesting with the psychopath test is it's as you describe it, it's your adventures among psychopaths and potential psychopaths and, and profilers and so on. 
And you portray yourself in this as, in some way, an anti-psychopathic, where, mm. where they're low in anxiety, you're high in anxiety. Uh, they're unempathetic, you're highly empathetic. Is this really, I mean, the question is, is, is it accurate? But I think maybe a more interesting question is, do you think there's such a thing as a mirror image of a psychopath? Um, yeah, I, I mean, everything you said did, did come out in the narrative, um, but none of it was intended. When I, when I started writing about psychopaths, I didn't realize it would become about this. But then I, I did realize that I was like the polar opposite of a psychopath. My, my amygdala overperforms. Uh, I don't know where the jury is on the whole amygdala business right now, because I know that neuroscience is... Yeah. Uh, um, but let's assume that, you know, what makes a psychopath is an underactive amygdala, and what makes me is an overactive amygdala. I suppose I am a kind of, um, you know, mirror opposite the psychopath. So, so James Blair has argued that psychopaths have their origin in sort of fearlessness as children, making them impossible to discipline, impossible to form connections with people. So an anti-psychopath would have a fearful childhood and would develop, you know, better empathetic connections and concern for others. Well, that sums up my childhood. It was quite fearful. <laughs> so, so, yeah. um, you know, when I realized this, that I was like absolutely the, the most appropriate person to write a book about psychopaths because I'm the opposite. Um, that felt, I was so pleased, you know, to, to have chanced upon that because I think every non-fiction writer has, and maybe every novelist too, has to ask themselves, you know, why am I the person writing this book? You know, can I justify, you know, my place in this story? Um, and if you can't justify it, if it's just another book, there's like, you know, there's no point in writing it. So, so when I realised that there was really an appropriate reason for me to write this book, and in fact it was coming out of my heart in a very kind of counterintuitive way, um, it, a, a journey amongst psychopaths would be a way to examine my own anxieties. Um, it was just, it was, it, was, it was great. And I think that's the reason why people like the book, uh, because it's sort of, because I'm an appropriate author for it. It would be strange to read a book like that, which was written by a psychopath. Oh. It would be, oh. I guess, imaginably unreadable. You actually, I remember reading this interview with you where you're talking about somebody, a war correspondent you know, who's fearless. And he says, I love the explosions, I love the adventure, and so on. Mm -hmm. And you said, and you basically said, look, that's actually, what would be better for a war correspondent would be somebody who war scares the crap out of. And that would be a better way to look at it and a better yeah. way to report it. And it's the same thing as with the psychopath does. Um, yeah, absolutely. It was. It's, it, it really annoyed me. This was a guy who was in Bosnia, and he was like telling me just how what, what a great time he had, you know, and it explosions, and it high jumps the chair. It was just amazing. And I said, you are the least appropriate person to be a war reporter, you know, because you you want to be embedded. You 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 know you you're loving this. So so actually, that's a general issue I was wondering about, which is that. You've made your career interviewing not just unusual people, but actually pretty dangerous people. Uh, your book about psychopaths, you have, your, your books deal with conspiracy theorists, uh, some in kind of who are in, um, have kind of ugly and really unpleasant conspiracies. And, um, and, and I would, I remember reading your webpage, you have a frequently asked question, and one question is, so it says, you know, I'm, I'm being so, uh, 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 caught up in some sort of mind control. Can I talk to you about this? And you say, no, you cannot. Yeah. Are you constantly having to purge your inbox from people who are psychotic and, and delusional and, and extremely unpleasant? Well, I've taken my email address down from the internet now. Uh, not because I was being, um, tell you the truth, not because I was being kind of hounded by, by people like that. Actually, it was because when the psychopath test first came out, it really kind of touched people, and I started to get hundreds and hundreds of, of emails from, from, from people who wanted to tell me their stories. And I'd get these, and they were really long emails. And, uh, you know, so if I wrote back a really long answer to them, then I wasn't getting, you know, any writing done at that. I suppose I was writing five paragraphs. I have to write them five paragraphs back. 
And then, and then that's impossible. And then so I thought, so I'd write a really short answer, and then I'd send that off, and people would sometimes come back and sort of say that they're insulted, you know, because my answer was so short. And so I thought, I can't win here, so, so that's why I, I took my, my thing down. Um, but I used to get huge amounts of, of emails from people who thought they were victims of MKUltra, and it did, it did surprise me um, that so many people had the same delusion. Um, I mean, there are real victims of MK Ultra out there. Um, you know, people, MK Ultra did exist, and people were victimised by so it. Victims of what? Oh, MK Ultra. Do, do you know about this? No. Okay, this was a. This really was a real. You know, like a lot of conspiracy theories, there's a germ of reality, and and the the germ of reality is that in the early 1950s, the CIA really did experiment yeah. with mind control. And they called it MK Ultra, and it was all run by a man called Sidney Gottlieb, um, who this kind of charismatic, strange, um, mad scientist Gottlieb. And so there really were victims, but there's a huge number of delusional people out there who believe they're victims of MK Ultra when they aren't. Yeah. Um, and they were all emailing me to ask if I could tell their stories. And after a while, I just got really grumpy. And I was like emailing back to say I'd just given up smoking. So I was kind of grumpy off emailing back to say they <laughs> don't have the resources. You know, everybody thinks that. I mean, you know, Jesus. You know, like anybody who thinks there's a van at the bottom of their driveway um, and they're being spied on and zapped with microwave weapons. You know, MI5 do not have the resources. <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, so, so that's why I didn't want to investigate them because because it, it was clearly a sort of shared a shared delusion. Wow. Huh. We went to a hotel. A producer at the time, John Sargent, um, took me to a meeting of MK Ultra survivors at a hotel, at like an airport hotel somewhere. And it was just clear to me, you know, they all thought that they were like kidnapped sex slaves. And you know they were they were raped by Kennedy and Kissinger. You know they all had these kind of very grandiose delusions. Um, I started to feel really sorry for the people. I, mean, I felt sorry for them, of course. And I also felt sorry for the people who really were victims of MK Ultra. They were like needles in the haystack. It sounds amazingly sad. But yeah. So so MK Ultra is a clear case, but one of the I mean, one of the surprising things about the psychopath test is the narrative shifts in a certain way at a halfway point. So you learn how to diagnose psychopaths. You talk about some real clear cases. And then it seems to me, and you can tell me if this is right, you start getting more and more skeptical. I mean, maybe that didn't happen chronologically, but, but the story is, oh, you get more skeptical. You deal with these cases like Tony, this guy in Broadmoor, who you interview. And is he just a psychopath or just kind of a little bit of a not-so-empathetic guy? You interview uh, Al Dunlop, this... Uh, industrialist who seems like a psychopath in so many ways, but not so much in other ways. And it seems as if by the end of the story, you're really skeptical of, this, of the psychological diagnosis category. Although I'm not skeptical of the existence of psychopaths, I, I, and, I'm, and I'm not skeptical either, actually, of the hair checklist. Um, I mean, I know that people have certain issues with certain aspects of the hair checklist. One thing that comes up is how can you have... Um, cunning, manipulative, and impulsivity, you know, in the same checklist. Yeah. Um, so I know people have sort of issues, but, but I'm not, but I don't have problems with, with, the, with the checklist, and I don't have problems with the existence of psychopaths. I know that they do exist. But, but I, it becomes a story very much about confirmation bias, and how a lot of people in, in greater positions of power than I succumb to it. Um, you know, Hare would tell me that, that um, you know, he would be trying to teach people the checklist, uh, people who were, you know, in charge of, like, civil commitment, in charge of, you know, these centres where people could be locked up for the rest of their lives, and he said they were picking their fingers, and they were doodling, and he was trying to teach them how to, you know, use his checklist properly. Um, Tony and Broadmoor, you know, is an ambiguous figure in that book. Yeah. Is he or isn't he a psychopath? And, and I think the fact is, you know, he is. He, 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 he is. Um, his diagnosis isn't wrong. Um, the really ambiguous person was Al Dunlap, yeah. the CEO, uh, because 
here's somebody who, you know, liberal society of which I am a member, um, would love him to be a classic psychopath. Love the idea of a kind of nefarious CEO, ruthless CEO, who would like, you know, close down factories, turning towns into ghost towns, the share price skyrockets. The great something like that was a classic psychopath. In many ways, you know, he, he I went through the site, I went to his house and I went through the checklist with him and, you know, he did redefine many of the items on the checklist as business positives. Uh, so, you know, like, um, grandiose said that, you know, I joke, you know, grandiose sense of self-worth um, would have been hard for him to deny because we, we were starting to go the giant oil printing himself. Um, but there were, there were some items on the checklist that he said absolutely no to, like early behaviour problems, juvenile delinquency, and my immediate thought was, well, I'm not going to put that in the book. And then I realised, you know, I, I, I had succumbed. You know, the, the, the psychopath checklist had kind of turned to be a little bit psychopathic in that I was kind of desperate to just shove him into this box. So, so the question of successful psychopaths is really interesting to me. One story, the story which I'm fond of, of the evolution of empathy and compassion and sympathy, is that these are biological adaptations. We have them. They're hardwired in us. Um, I study children, and you study, you see this emergence in children and babies. And it, it's adaptive because it helps us get along, because we, it helps us be kind to our kin, establish relationships, and so on. It would be an embarrassment to this view if people who are deficient in empathy, compassion, sympathy, did very well in the world. Mm. Now, it wouldn't refute it, because, for instance, the world we live in now is very different from the world in which we evolved. And you could argue certain features of living in a world of billions of people turn things upside down. But my inclination is to think that somebody who is, as, who, who is a Tony, who is, is, is a psychopath, would not end up climbing the corporate ladder or climbing the political ladder or do well at all. Do you mm -hmm. think that's... And I know to hear disagrees. So where, where do you stand on this? Well, well let me ask you, um, before I tell you my view, I mean, so, so Hare's theory is that, uh, which, you know, backs up with having done the studies, mm -hmm. Uh, one percent of the general public would score third. I think. I think. I think it's in the thirties, if I remember rightly. One percent of the general public would score, you know, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, and above in in the checklist. But but three point nine percent of cigarettes uh, would score like thirty. So it's not like a little bit psychopathic. It's like really psychopathic. Um, so for, so let me ask you, what, what's your view on on on, on that theory of his? I guess, I guess what I, I would. I mean, two things. One thing is, to the extent that that's true, I think it, it might be consistent with the idea we now have certain social institutions where mm -hmm. cold-blooded psychopathy can be a benefit. Well, for most of human history, because you live with the same people all around, um, mm -hmm. all the time, and they're always monitoring you, and your social relationships were everything, psychopathy wouldn't pay. But now that we have corporations and, and, and you know, strangers, uh, psychopathy can pay. So you described Dunlop, loved firing people. But there was no equivalent in hunter-gather times of firing somebody and then never seeing them again. And right. so, so it might be, I mean, I wouldn't say capitalism in general. You made some sort of, I mean, I, I, I think I've heard you quoted as saying that at least certain forms of capitalism encourage psychopathy. And I think that may well be, be true. I guess another, another response is you'd want to pull apart different aspects of psychopathy and different aspects of empathy. So somebody might do well without being overly sensitive to the pain of others. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, I think it'd be hard to do well unless you could suss out what another person's thinking. Social mm -hmm. cognition or theory of mind. So I would, I would say I'd be very surprised if successful people were not good at that. Yes. Um, I mean, why I ended up is, is that certain, certain industries, the kind of short-term kill type industries yes. um, are the ones that could Dunlop really... Dunlop was a hedge fund? Uh, no, there, there's... But Dunlop was an asset stripper. Yeah. So you'd say that maybe that industry yeah. is what would reward psychopathic behaviours. Um, uh, hedge funds, obviously, is another yeah. example. Um, I half joke journalism. It's people who kind of go in, make a quick kill, and then get out again. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you... if, if if the hair checklist is the Bible of this, yeah. then, you know, the Richard Bransons of the world wouldn't, 
wouldn't fit in right. to that view at all. The ones who kind of assiduously build up, um, you know, businesses over decades. It's the people who kind of go in, make a killing, yeah. and leave again. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, of course, Mark Dice is coming to play. You know, I'm hugely against the American health insurance industry. So I see, uh, I see that as being something that, that would reward psychopathic behavior. So in some um, way, you can metaphorically talk about psychopathic society, more or less, with regard to empathy for those people. Yeah. And also, I, I interviewed, I promise never to name him, but I interviewed somebody who was close to Dunlap. And he said, in fact, can I get the book and read out what he said? Because it was the thing that was, you know, really chilled me. Um, here we go. Um, just take this up to find it. Um, so I left out Dunlap's house and interviewed over the phone somebody. Here we go. Um, interviewed over the phone somebody who knew him very well. And he said, here we are. Wall Street, or the darker side that writes these research reports, lionized the job cuts that, that Dunlap yeah. did. Um, if you look at the community of support, if you were to grab research reports of the time, you would be amazed at the comments, the level of callous jubilance over what he was doing. You'd probably wonder whether society had gone mad. And then he says, um, um, well, basically, he says, so who do you blame? I, I can't find it. He says, you know, who do you blame? Do you blame the outdone of the world? Um, uh, you know, or do you blame the entire crowd egging him on, the, yeah. the, the stockholders and so on? And, um, and, yeah, I mean, it's hard to look at that philosophy and not see that all the items that are being rewarded are items from, from the checklist. Grandiosity, superficial charm, lack of empathy, lack of remorse. Um, the thing that always made me laugh is that uh, in my first book, Then, there's a conspiracy theorist called David Icke yeah. who believes that... Um, you know, the shadowy elite that control the world are, are reptiles that have adopted human form. Are they, and, are they Jewish reptiles? Remind me. Um, well, the Anti-Defamation League were convinced that when he said blood drinking, child sacrifice. Oh, I see. Yeah, but, but he didn't say it out loud. No, he didn't say it out loud. And I think he's on an adult. That, that would be crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, but it sort of makes me laugh that this theory, it's kind of the same theory. Yes, it's saying yes, that there's yes. Crazy, yeah live among us, they look like us, they act like us because they're very superficially charming, but they're not like us, they're almost like a different species, and they're the ones who rule the world. And that's what people say about Obama, about Romney, about, about Clinton. I, I, there's never been a president that there wasn't somebody saying he's a psychopath. He's yeah, he didn't have emotions, but he was Yeah, apparently Glenn Beck, when this book first came out, uh, Glenn Beck apparently used it to diagnose Obama as a psychopath. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I could. I'm not surprised he would. I, I, I wouldn't think Obama would fit that. He's, Obama's a cool character, but he's, you know, he's, he's not, no juvenile delinquency, doesn't no, have a promiscuous guy. He's introverted and thoughtful, but I, I, I can't see anybody, except for the drones, I can't see anyone less psychopathic. <laughs> the, the, the drones do admit of a certain lack of compassion. Yeah. And, and, and there's always the torture, which is continuous. Yes. But anyway. Uh, so what about the flip side? So what about like real nice people like you and me who have our empathy dials maybe turned up a bit high, a bit higher than average, so that the suffering of others bothers us? Does this make us unfit for the world? No. I, um, and, and in fact, you know, I, I've said a few times in talks that I've given that, you know, anxiety disorders, as far as I'm concerned, are a sign of moral goodness. Um, if you have OCD, I mean, there's, you know, empathy and anxiety strike me as being, you know, very much connected. So if you have um, something like OCD, it should, you know, OCD, you know, show me a sufferer of OCD who isn't worried about offending people, who isn't worried about coming over, 
you know, as a racist or, or, or as a, you know, a Satanist if you come from a kind of religious there's family. A, there's a sub-disorder of anxiety disorders. I think of OCD called moral scrupulosity, which mm -hmm. is exactly that. You're terrified of doing the wrong things, of offending the wrong people. If it's religious, you've got to get the rituals exactly right. You don't want to offend God. But in general, you're, you're yeah. obsessed with not causing harm. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and the thing that really, you know, surprises me about OCD, although it's not surprising at all, is that if you're a kid with OCD in a religious family in, in you know, the deep south of America, your fear, your irrational fear will be that, you know, exactly what you said, you've offended God and that yes. the devil is inside of you. If, you've, if you're an English kid with OCD in, in an agnostic family, your rational fear is that you've come over as racist or, yeah. you know, pedophile. It's exactly the same thing, isn't it? It's just so but with these kind of cultural, um, these kind of superficial cultural differences. Um, really interests me that when our brains go wrong, they always go wrong in, in uncannily similar ways. Kind of shows that we're not all individual snowflakes, like we'll have to think of my, um, my, so, my OCD manifests itself in that way. Over sending an, writing an email about somebody to somebody else and then becoming terrified, I sent it to the person who it was about. Um, yeah. And you know, sending the wrong emails or tweeting the wrong things are sort of the, the modern OCD target, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So of course, I mean, undoubtedly, the world would be a better place if if um, OCD was rewarded instead of psychopathy. But that's but that's answering the, <laughs> in one way. You're saying that that you know. The anxiety disorders manifest a, a, a moral goodness. But another way is answering my question by saying, yeah, people whose empathy is turned up high um, really will do worse in the world. They'll, they'll suffer. OCD people suffer. People with anxiety suffer. Um, well, they certainly suffer. Um, and, and, and I would imagine they're just less capable, less competent. Do you think, I mean, I would like to think, um, you know, my, my, the wishful thinking end of the psychopath test. This is, you know, I've never tried to write something, you know, with more of a happy ending as I did with this book, which is that, you know, the, um, the irrational, you know, there's no evidence, I, I say at the end of the book, but there's no evidence that we have been placed on this planet to be especially happy or especially normal, but maybe our unhappinesses, our anxieties, our compulsions, those least fashionable aspects of our personalities are the things that lead us to do rather interesting things. Now, I recognize that that's massive wish fulfillment, <laughs> at the same time, I would like to think it's true. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so, so. It makes us better writers, right? I mean, there's not, there's not a history of great psychopathic writers, except for Norman Mailer. <laughs> well, Norman Mailer famously befriended a psychopath, but he was probably, uh, yeah. Um, and massive, and of course I'm joking about Norman Mailer, although he did befriend a, a, a great writer called Jack Abbott, who, got him out of prison, and Abbott, you know, promptly killed somebody because he was a psychopath. Um, so he, here is an example of a great writer who was a psychopath, but you know you would think that the great artists are the ones who are very empathetic, wouldn't, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd yes. like to think so. Yes, yes. And though at the same time very selfish. So it's, it's complicated. A lot of great artists, you know, build, and great scientists as well, build their life around themselves and are right. exceedingly selfish with regard to their own status and their and, and but but it's complicated. You couldn't be a great writer at least without the ability to get in the heads of other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How seriously uh, you take their feelings is a different story. Yes, yes. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I would say, I mean, just speaking personally, that my writing gets better as I become more empathetic as I get older. Have you become more empathetic as you got older? Yeah, which is why I... I um, uh, um, you know, that theory that people get more right-wing as they get older, mm -hmm. I've never bought that theory because I, I always think, you know, when you're young and you're starting out and you're ambitious and you want to carve your place in the world, that's when you're right-wing. And then when you realise, when you look around you and see, you know, the heartbreak in the world uh, and, and the, the, the pain and the trouble and the sadness, that's going to make you more left-wing because, you know, you've carved your place out in the world by then, so you get less ambitious. And you start to want to, you know, really help people. So and I, I, then when you get older, you're, you're, you're dependent on people. And then you can become full-blown socialist or communist because you want people to, to give up their selfish desires and take care of you. 
Yeah, I, but, but, but also, you know, it's very hard to walk through life, you know, um, impervious to suffering. The, the, the more suffering you see as you, as you age. I mean, that's, this is true in my case anyway. I was, you know, I was, I, I was definitely, you know, when I was younger, I was more ambitious and I wanted to, you know, be successful and I would, you know, think about myself all the time. But I'm not like that any, anymore. Uh, well, I'll tell you the big event which changed me. It was having children. Having children mm -hmm. made me, for better or worse, more empathetic, more squeamish about violence, more worried about, about suffering. Um, mm -hmm. That was a huge trigger, which had a huge dramatic effect. Right, right. So why do you think some people don't get more right wing as they get older? Because that's the that's the cliche. I guess I would think left wing and right wing reflect a set of different things. So as you get mm -hmm. older, for instance, um, certain excesses of people, mm -hmm. which are often forbidden under a, a left wing view, like sexual promiscuity and dis distrust of authority become unpleasant. Uh -huh. So so take the parameter of how what you think about authority. It wouldn't be surprising as you get older, you take authority more and more seriously because mm -hmm. you're more invested in society, you're more you you may be more fragile, you have a family of people you love. And so the police are no longer the pigs that you don't like. And mm -hmm. so you may have more of a right wing view in that regard. But I think yeah. you're capturing a real insight, which is in another regard, which is the sort of how much we are selfish agents by ourselves. The most libertarian creature in the world is a teenage boy. I mean, I have, I have two teenage boys, and they're both, to different degrees, pretty libertarian. And I think that fades over time as you become invested mm -hmm. in a society and appreciate the benefits that a society can give you. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're saying that, the thing about the you know, respect for the place as you get older, we, we recently moved to, to New York. The city is stop, stop and frisk. Yes. You know, this, this NYPD policy of assuming everyone's a criminal, especially if you're young and yes. black and living in, in a Harlem or, or Brooklyn. Or so they're not exclusively, uh, you know, stop and frisk is mainly um, for those people, but it's kind of, that attitude is for everybody. And that's really shocked me since I moved to New York. The, the, uh, you know, I didn't realize the real value of living in a liberal society until I moved out of one. Um, so, yeah. That's interesting. Um, I, I would think, I, I, I agree with you as a matter of principle. I would think personally, um, with your appearance, and particularly your accent, you will never be stopped and frisked. As in, there are, there are stereotypes that benefit you immensely. Although, you know what, I mean, obviously you're right. Um, but, um, but what I'm trying to ask about in my next book, actually, is that I said this to a lawyer at the Bronx a couple of days ago. I said, you know what, this is, this is what I'm sort of asking about in my next book. I said, you know, the, the, the children of the poor in New York are treated terribly, and the children of the rich in New York are treated terribly, and she gave me a look as if to say, I don't care about the children of the rich. Um, but what I mean is that there's a kind of a, a extraordinary pressure is put on both aspects of the society. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, an, an extraordinary and dysfunctional pressure is put on the children of the poor in New York and the children of the rich in New York. So one of your, one of your essays in Lost at Sea uh, is, a, is a wonderful exploration of, of people of different income levels where you go up, I think, by scales of 10. So you have a poor person, somebody makes 10 five. times more. Oh, five, okay. Five times yeah. more, five times more. So, you, so you, you go from somebody who is in poverty to somebody I think is a multimillionaire, perhaps a billionaire. Is that what you're pursuing in your next book? No, although um, I think I'm looking at similar themes. Uh, where I'm going with my next book at the moment, I mean, these things are always you know, mutating, but I'm very interested in, in public shame. Huh. Um, I'm, I'm trying to write a book about people who have been publicly shamed and what their experience teaches us about society. So like famous people like uh, uh, Elliot Spitzer? Sorry. Yeah, people like that, but also um, stop and frisk. Actually, is is an example of that. When you read reports on um, on victims of stop and frisk, um, they often talk about the feelings of humiliation yeah. and how they're almost creating a kind of psychological ghetto. So the Bronx, 
becomes a kind of psychological ghetto as well as an economic. Um, so it's not just successful, famous, publicly shamed people, but it's the it's the whittling away um, of people's confidence by everyday public shaming and things like stopping trips. That's absolutely that. That sounds fascinating. I mean, there, there, are, well, people, there, there are people who, who, there are law professors and people who argue that shame, they defend shame. They say shame is, is, a, is a good tool of punishment and that a good society well, uses I, shame as a tool in that way. Well, I, actually, I met um, and interviewed uh, a law professor at Yale who has advocated shame as a um, Dan, Dan Kahan. Dan Kahan, or yeah. Kahan. Kahan, yeah. Kahan. yeah. Um, so, so I went to, to Yale and, and met and interviewed him. Um, I mean, he, he comes very much from a liberal perspective, which I think was, was interesting. Um, and, his, and I won't go into you know, what he said to me. Um, so I found what he said really interesting, and I, and I liked him. I mean, he, he's coming from a good place. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd, I'm not sure I agree with him, but I understand where he's coming from. His, his view is that public shaming is a hell of a lot less bad than prison because the shaming in prison is, you know, unthinkable. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad for, your, for your encouraging looks about this, this story. No, it sounds terrific. It Thank sounds, you. It's, 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 it's sort of the opposite of the, of the psychopath in some way, which is, you know, now we're dealing with... Um, with people's empathetic response, their feelings of, of, of being a figure exposed to the world. And they, you know, exploiting exactly what it is that the psychopath lacks. Yes, 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 absolutely. And, you know, I didn't really look at it that way, but I think you're, I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. Um, and I'm also meeting people who've been publicly shamed, and it was like water off a duck's back. Yeah. They didn't mind at all. Uh, and so I'm asking, should we should we admire those people? Um, I mean, obviously, each case, each individual case is, has a different set of criteria, but, but these are the kind of, you know, questions I'm looking at. This sounds a terrific topic. Um, I wanted to turn, just, just uh, before we finish, to we've been talking about empathy and the continuum of empathy, but then there's credulity, and so you deal with a lot of conspiracy theories and everything, and... So, you know, you take somebody who thinks the London subway bombings were a hoax, which is something you talk about um, in, in, in some of your writing, or, um, or this guy, I'm trying to, Alex Jones. Yes. Sorry. Um, this guy, Alex Jones, who was on Piers Morgan and believes that school shootings like Columbine are a plot of the government to take yeah. away our guns. And Who I spent a lot of time with Alex Jones in really? Rose my first. Oh yeah, there's a, I spent a long time with Alex Jones in my first book. Then uh, I, I went on some adventures with him, so it's funny to see him suddenly become so Yeah, he seems like like such a prick. <laughs> he, I, I mean, I contend that Alex turns it on for the cameras. Maybe uh, he's, he's not as crazy as. Uh, as he thinks he is. Whenever I say that, no, I'm sorry, he's not as crazy as he as he likes. Presents him. himself to be. Yeah. Whenever I say that, I always think, I wonder whether Alex is going to get kind of annoyed with me saying this and try and sue me. And but then I think, well, if that was the case, it would be the first person who's ever sued somebody for alleging that they're less crazy yes. than other people. Yes. Yeah. yes. My God, I really do hold those crazy beliefs. Stop telling people I'm reasonable. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, um, so, you know, part of what strikes you with these stories is, is the immorality of it. So you're, you're, you're very good talking about, you know, how cruel it is to somebody who's, say, maimed in a, in a, in a bombing to tell them that, they're, that it's a hoax. Or, or, but, but then there's the issue of credulity itself. So put aside the moral issue. Some people just, I, again, it's like there's another dial where you have uh, some people who, and I'm actually kind of one of them, which I don't believe, I, I'm highly skeptical. I'm an atheist. I, 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 don't, I disagree with all the paranormal phenomena. My dial is turned down very low, and I probably miss some things that are true. Um, um, I, I say, oh, that, that, that's crap. I don't believe it. When it, I should believe it. But well, that's other extreme. Earlier, you, you, you seem surprised that there was some truth in the whole exactly. See, I'm control thing. Exactly. And after we're done, I'm going to go on Wikipedia and see if you just made it up. But <laughs> you know, so so yeah. So I, I so my default is not to believe it, and then. But then there's other people who's, who, and, and I'm, I'm willing to accept for the sake of argument, um, a sort of epistemological caution here, that, that maybe I have, maybe I'm too skeptical. 
But then there's people who are way credulous uh-huh. and insanely credulous, and they believe things that cannot be true, bizarre esoteric conspiracy theories. Do you think it really is a sort of personality trait that just varies across people? Well, actually, I, you know, like you, I am a skeptic, and I go to skeptic conferences, and I speak at them, and I've got skeptic friends, uh, Rebecca Watson, who are like, you know, big sort of skeptic spokespeople. Um, however, I actually, I like credulity. I, I, for me, credulity, when I feel it, you know, when I slide into you know, believing in something I've never believed in before. Um, I always think it makes for very good writing. I mean, it happened in the psychopath test. You know, I, mm-hmm. I got very drunk with my psychopath crossing powers after I did the air course. Uh, and I remember flying to Toronto. They were they were premiering The Many Scary Ghosts at the Toronto Film Festival. And on the plane, I was with Peter, who wrote the screenplay. And I said to him, yeah, psychopaths are everywhere and you can spot them with this checklist and they rule the world and there's this woman who's following me on Twitter and I'm pretty sure she's a psychopath and uh, you know I've done a checklist on her you know through her tweets and I think she's a psychopath and Peter was looking at me as if to say you know what have you become <laughs> and I absolutely believe it and, and in retrospect those are my favorite times you know when I when my skepticism goes out the window and I become very credulous um, as long as I can come out of it the other side, that for me creates the best writing. Um, Eric Olson, going back to MK Ultra, there was a guy called Frank Olson mm-hmm. who was, he, you know, some say he was killed by the CIA and some say he was, um, he committed suicide because he was given LSD um, by the CIA against his knowledge. Either way, I was talking to his son, Eric. Um, who said to me, he quoted, he said it was Oliver Wendell Holmes, and, and the line was um, something like, I would not give my life, no, I, 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 would, I, do not, I don't care for simplicity, this side of complexity, but I would give my life for simplicity, the other side of complexity. And I, that's always been my great credo, but, but to get to the simplicity on the other side of complexity, you have to become credible. Uh, so credible, you have to, you have to become... Um, um, you have to, um, yeah, become friendly. You have to, you have to lose your incredulity. I love that line. I mean, I think it's, it's probably true. I, I, I think your writing is terrific, and I think it's a nice description of your writing, which is, is simple. But it's not simple because that's all you got. It's simple because there's, there's this huge body of stuff you've been working on, and we're sort of seeing the tip of the iceberg, and, and uh, it reflects a lot of things going on. It has been nicely distilled in a simple way, and I think it's really super appealing. Thank you. It's, it's, I mean, it's certainly what I spend my life trying to do. I, I you know, you, you wouldn't believe, you know, for these books that I write, you, you wouldn't believe the number of, you know, files and memory sticks, and and yet when you, when, you know, I mean, unbelievable years and years of research, and then, you know, but by the time they're written, they're pretty slim yeah. fetish stories. But but that is, you know, that's because I'm desperately searching for simplicity on the other side of complexity. Um, um, I guess the last thing I'll ask you, and it's probably a question you often get, but I've, I've sort of wondered about it, is, you know, you wrote your first, you, you wrote them in 2001 and it got published. And, and what's happened since then is the internet has exploded. Mm-hmm. And, and it seems a person like me observes a lot more crazy stuff now because I could just search for it and find it all over the place. Do you think that, that this explosion of, of what I, I could find mm-hmm. on the web and Twitter and so on is, is because I didn't see it before, I didn't go, I didn't speak to neo-Nazis or KKK or lizard people or so on, or do uh, you think that, that, that this has allowed, this has encouraged craziness, this has encouraged uh, delusional beliefs? Well, I think it has. I mean, I think post 9-11, um, conspiracy theories, you know, Virgins, you know, there was a time when where the statistic bandied around. It's like I can't remember. It was like three out of ten Americans believed, you know, some form of 9/11 conspiracy theory. And um, so, not only was suddenly a huge number of people believing this stuff, but it became very unpleasant. You know, there was a certain lightness and charm <laughs> to, the, to the pre-9-11 conspiracy world, you know, that I think I managed to, to capture them. Yeah. 
Um, but it's, but if there was any charm to it, it certainly stopped being charming after 9-11. Yes. And then, you know, you, you have to lay the blame on the internet to, to, an, ex, to an extent. Um, because, of course, there is always, you know, people out there who will believe what, what you believe. And, and then, you know, it used to annoy me so much that, that I used to get so annoyed that I, I would be attacked by conspiracy theorists. Um, and I was, you know, you know, me and my producer, John Sargent, we were the ones getting on planes and going off and meeting people and doing research. They were fortifying themselves with YouTube videos. You know, they used to really bug me, you know? Um, so, it, so it's the reason why chemtrails, you know, became such a popular conspiracy theory. Because you look up in the sky, it's right, you don't have to do any bloody work. You don't have to get on planes. You don't have to approach hundreds of people for interviews. You just look up and there they are. So, so you're annoyed because you're lazy. Yeah. It's not I mean, just crazy, it's, but it's just, it, 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 they're not working yeah. at all. And it's self, and it's, and it's sort of self-perpetuating yeah. bubbles as well. I was annoyed for those two reasons. <laughs> look, this was great. This was great talking to you. I really, I really appreciate the time. Paul, no, I really appreciate so, it. I know we tried to do it before, but you got flu, and then I got flu, and we all got ill, and so I'm glad that we made it happen. Let's do it again sometime. Take care. Thanks, Paul. Bye.